Hello, and thank you for joining me for this brief tour through the early years of development in University Heights. I'm Kristen Harms, and I've lived in University Heights since 1992. I'm not a historian by training or by profession, but got involved in historic preservation in 2004, more or less out of necessity. What really propelled me into the world of historic preservation was the infamous log cabin house, which is located right across the alley behind me and shown here in 2004. It was built in 1908 by James Creelman and is one of the oldest and most unique homes in University Heights. The property was sold by the Creelman family in 1999, and the new owner had the home historically designated in 2002, started renovations on it, and then abandoned the home, leaving it exposed to the elements. Windows were broken, the yard was a mess, and it appeared that homeless had taken up residence inside. So after numerous calls to code enforcement and to the police, I found out the home was historically designated, and then became really concerned that our community was about to lose an historic gem due to owner neglect. At that point, I called the University Heights Historical Society, Save Our Heritage Organization, and the City Attorney's Office. After the concerted efforts of all these organizations and many concerned residents, the property was finally sold to Dan Ramirez in 2008, who lovingly restored the property to its original condition. So shown here is the home after it was built in 1908, and now in 2018, after being lovingly restored by owner Dan Ramirez. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Much of tonight's presentation is drawn from the cable cars and ostrich feathers self-guided walking tour of University Heights, which was originally written in 1996 by University Heights historian Alex Bevel and printed by Save Our Heritage Organization. The guide was expanded and reprinted in 2006 by the University Heights Historical Society and is available for purchase from the University Heights Community Development Corporation. I'd also like to acknowledge the San Diego History Center, San Diego State University Library Digital Collections, the University Heights Historical Society, and Nancy Wormington for some of the photos and images shown in tonight's presentation. So now for a brief tour of the early history of University Heights from 1887 to 1955. The early history of University Heights must really be put into the broader context of San Diego history and urbanization. Until 1919, most passengers and freight arrived in San Diego by ship. San Diego was not connected to the transcontinental transcontinental rail system until 1885 and had no direct connection to the eastern United States until 1919. Shown here in 1890 is the SS Orizaba docked at the wharf at the foot of Fifth Avenue, which ran regular service between San Diego and San Francisco. Once passengers disembarked at the wharf, a horse-drawn streetcar could take them up Fifth Avenue to the Gaslamp District and nearby resort hotels. As San Diego residents began to build homes just east of downtown San Diego, the streetcar followed into the neighborhoods of Sherman Heights, Golden Hill, Grant Hill, and Stockton. The history of University Heights begins during San Diego's first period of large-scale urbanization when the, first, when the final link between San Diego and the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1885. Several speculative real estate developments were initiated to accommodate the increased demand for housing, one of which was University Heights. In 1887, University Heights was subdivided by the College Hill Land Association which promised prospective buyers the proposed San Diego College of Arts, which is shown here, that would be located in University Heights. Lot sales began in University Heights in 1887, and construction efforts of the university began soon thereafter with the pouring of its foundation and the building's cornerstone. 
On August 6, 1888, the first official subdivision map, number 558, was filed with the San Diego County Recorder delineating the University Heights subdivision. UH was bounded on the north by the rim of Mission Valley, on the south by University Avenue, on the west by today's 163 freeway, and on the east by today's Boundary Street, which at the time was the boundary between City Pueblo land and ex-Mission San Diego land. Construction efforts, however, were brief, with lagging lot sales due to an economic downturn, and by the early 1890s, construction efforts permanently ceased, leaving the college property vacant until the turn of the century. Also in 1888, the Electric Rapid Transit, or ERT, ex extended its electrified, rail, electrified cable car from downtown San Diego up 4th Street to University Heights. By then, UH had been established by the College Land Hill Association, and streets were being graded, water and sewer service was established, and lots were offered for sale. However, ERT ex experienced difficulties from the beginning, including frequent shutdowns, various alterations and repairs, an oil shortage, and legal battles. And so by 1889, the line closed. In 1889, the San Diego Cable Car Company organized using leftover assets from the ERT, including some of the cars and most of the rail network. One route ran north on 4th Street, east on University Avenue, and north on Normal Street and Park Boulevard to a turntable on Adams Avenue. In 1890, to boost rail ridership, the San Diego Electric Cable Company, or excuse me, the San Diego Cable Railway developed a 5 acre Acre Park, known as the Bluffs, at the end of the rail line in University Heights. The park included landscape grounds and an attractive pavilion designed by William S. Hubbard. However, due to a series of financial setbacks, the cable railway was forced to shut down after just 13 months of operation. It fell into receivership until 1895 when it was bought by George Kerper of Cincinnati, Ohio. Kerper reorganized the company into the Citizens Traction Company and electrified the rail line. You'll see this red arrow in the, in the photo, which um, shows you can barely make out the, the round uh, lily pond, which the remnants still remain and can be seen off of Mission Cliff, Mission Cliff Drive. Kerper began to restore the bluffs and renamed it Mission Cliff Park. With a merry-go-round as well as a children's playground and a shooting gallery, the park became the place to go on Sunday afternoons. Dancing parties were held in the pavilion where Japanese lanterns hung from the rafters. The first San Diego outdoor production of William Shakespeare's As You Like It was performed at the park in 1897. Theatrical and vaudeville companies also performed here, and after much opposition from the San Diego City Council, a liquor license was granted and a German beer garden was opened. Kerper also proposed to construct a cog railway down to the base of the canyon below the park in Mission Valley, where it was to connect with an electric-powered trolley that would take sightseers to the ruins of Mission San Diego de Acala. However, Kerber's dreams never materialized because in 1898, during the height of a nationwide depression, his company also went into receivership. So early history of San Diego was characterized by, by a series of boom and bust cycles between the 1870s and 1890s that were primarily due to rumors of a transcontinental railroad connection and associated real estate speculation. During the boom, population increased to 40,000, but during the bust, dropped to 16,000. During this time, several transit companies came into business and went out just as quickly, including the San Diego Streetcar Company, the San Diego Cable Rail Railroad, the Electric Rapid Transit, and the Citizens Traction Company. In the late 1880s, John D. Spreckles, son of wealthy Sugar King, Cloth Spreckles began investing in San Diego's infrastructure. 
1891, he formed the San, G San Diego Electric Railway, bought and consolidated several of San Diego's failed or failing transportation lines, and began a process of massive expansion. By 1910, the San Diego, San Diego Electric Railway would be the only remaining trolley operator in San Diego, covering over 200 miles of track from La Jolla to Chula Vista. The new San Diego Electric Railway routes extended into barren scrubland and paved the way for new neighborhoods, including Hillcrest, Mission Hills, North Park, and University Heights. That said, it was the San Diego Electric Railway Company that purchased the failed Citizens Traction Company from George Kerper in 1898. In addition to the tracks, rolling stock, and power plant, the company obtained 327 lots formerly held by the Citizens Traction Company in University Heights. The San Diego Electric Railway Company widened the right of way from Fifth and University, where it was connected to an already existing Spreckles owned trolley line that traveled up to the park. The railway tracks entered University Heights at 4th and University, traveled east until jogging northeast along University Boulevard, today's Normal Street, past the Normal School, and then north along Park Boulevard. The red arrow on the screen shows where the Normal School was located there on Normal Street, right on the trolley line. After its purchase by the San Diego Electric Railway Company in 1898, the park was again renovated and, and renamed Mission Cliff Gardens. John Spreckles wished to showcase the area as a botanical garden rather than an amusement park, and so proceeded to remove all the attractions and to concentrate on the pavilion and the grounds, which encompassed some 38 acres at its height in 1914. In 1904, Spreckles hired Scottish-born landscape gardener John Davidson as the park superintendent and tasked him with redesigning the park into a botanical wonder. Under Davidson, the once nearly barren park blossomed into a beautiful botanical garden. It was not long before the emergence of annual flower shows drew tourists from all over the state. View pergolas or shelters were constructed at the most advantageous viewpoints in the gardens, and Sunday picnics at Mission Cliffs became a great favorite with hundreds of San Diegans. Soon annual gatherings and picnics held by clubs and societies were instituted at the gardens. The pavilion, the main building in the park, was also put to use by clubs and societies. Inside the pavilion was, where, was a large hall where dances and entertainment could be held. As the gardens Expanded innovations were made. A walk-in bird aviary, aviary was built in 1912, and bird watching became popular at the gardens. A miniature Japanese garden also became a favorite of many visitors. It was commissioned by the San Diego Electric Railway and designed by the proprietor of the Japanese Tea Garden at Coronado. In short, Mission Cliff, Mission Cliff Gardens was really the Balboa Park of its day. And the red arrow at the bottom of the screen shows the former lily pond again, uh, right in the center of the park. And the red arrow at the top shows you where the normal school would have been. And the street right down the middle is North Avenue. Shown here is one of the San Diego Electric Railway streetcars at the entrance to Mission Cliff Gardens on Adams Avenue at North Avenue. In the late 1890s, San Diego officials believed that a normal school should be established to help the town grow and increase the certification of teachers. The site of the aborted San Diego College of the Arts was donated to the state of California to build a normal school a state-sponsored teacher training college. In 1898, the Normal School Board of Trustees selected the San Diego firm of Hebert and Gill to design the new school building, which was created in the classic Beaux Art style. Ground was broken for construction on August 1st, 1898, and the building was dedicated on May 1st, 1899. 
During the building's construction, the first classes were held in November 1898 with 91 students and 17 faculty in the building shown here at the southwest corner of 6th and F in downtown San Diego. Classes moved to the Grand Normal School in University Heights in May 1899, even as construction continued. This 1924 aerial shot shows the location of the Normal School, as well as the teacher's training annex, which I will cover a little later in this presentation. The red arrow shows where the teacher's training annex um, was built and still stands today. The, the Grand Normal School, however, it no longer remains. But the street to the left is Campus Avenue, to the north is uh, Mead Avenue, and then to the east is Park Boulevard, and then curving down diagonally is Normal Street. One hundred thirty five students were enrolled by the end of the first year and enrollment grew to four hundred by nineteen ten. Anticipating for the potential for growth fueled by the extension of the San Diego Electric Railway line, the University Heights Syndicate formed in nineteen oh two to reorganize the development of University Heights. The company's first subdivision along the new trolley line extension was Valle Vista Terrace, attractive luxury homes on Panorama Drive, which provided magnificent views of Mission Valley and glimpses of the ocean. Shown here is a beautiful home built in 1907 for the syndicate's presidents by master architects Irving Gill and William Hebert. In 1904, John Spreckles invited Harvey Bentley to re relocate his ostrich farm from Coronado to University Heights, adjacent to Mission Cliff Gardens. For an additional fee, visitors to the gardens could gaze upon a dozen or more ostriches around the farm. Fearless visitors could even ride the huge birds. On the utilitarian side, ostrich feathers were selling for about $350 a pound as they were in great demand for ladies' hats, bows, and stoles. Across the street from the ostrich farm was William Hinton's silk, San Diego Silk Mill. Silk production was a thriving industry by the turn of the century. The silk mill, the silk mill building still stands today and has been adaptively reused over the years as a studio, restaurant, and coffee house. University Heights did not really start to develop until 1907, when the San Diego Electric Railway was extended east from Florida Street along Adams Avenue. Also during this time, a lawsuit finally ended between Spreckles and one of its ex-partners, Elisha Babcock. The dispute was over the ownership and operation of the Southern California Mountain and Water Supply Company, which they had developed in the 1890s. The suit was settled in favor of Spreckles, who then supplied the city of San Diego with water. The water was stored in a reservoir in University Heights between El Cajon Boulevard and Howard Avenue and still stands today. The tower shown in this picture dates from 1923. In 1912, the city pur purchased most of the reservoirs and water distribution system of the Southern California Mountain Water Company from Spreckles which gave the city a municipally owned and operated water supply system from mountain to meter. This produced still another building boom, including a number of the large apartment blocks in University Heights. In 1910, the San Diego Chamber of Commerce proposed an exposition in Balboa Park to advertise the remarkable growth San Diego was experiencing and its potential for investment as the first American port of call on the West Coast to ships traveling through the soon-to-be-completed Panama Canal. After the announcement of the proposed exposition, San Diego San Diego experienced a large-scale increase in home, hotel, and apartment construction. 
A number of structures along Adams Avenue and Park Boulevard were built during that time, including the Mission Cliff Apartments, the Weirth Apartments, shown here, and a line of trolley-oriented businesses clustered along the length of the trolley tracks on Park Boulevard. Note the initials FW, standing for Frank Weirth, at the top of the Weirth Apartment, shown here. In 1910, the Teachers Training Annex was built adjacent to the normal school to train future teachers in classroom procedures under real life conditions. The building was designed by Nathan Ellery and George C. Sellen in the Italian Renaissance style and still stands today. In 1914, of the 136 new students enrolled for the school year, 17 were from California counties, excluding San Diego, and 26 were from other states. In 1913, a massive trolley car barn was built on Adams Avenue on the property adjoining the Bentley Ostrich Farm. The cavernous reinforced brick building was used to store and perform minor service on several hundred trolleys, which would enter and exit through a series of switches off, off of Florida Street. After the trolleys ceased running in 1945, the car barn was sold to the San Diego Paper Box Company and in 1979, the building was sold and demolished to make way for a condominium project. Sadly, due to the popularity of Balboa Park after the 1915 Panama, California International Exposition and the development of Mission Beach by Spreckles in the 1920s, Mission Cliff's popularity diminished as a local attraction. The final blow was the death of Spreckles in 1926. Mission Cliff Gardens was closed in 1930 and relegated as a physical non-operating property. Park Superintendent John Davidson was allowed to live in the pavilion, but as the electric railway company cut down on water expenses, most of the flowers and small plants died. The only plants remaining now are the tall canary pines, tall Canary Island pines, palms, excuse me, north of the intersection of Park and Adams. After Davidson's death in 1935, the gardens deteriorated. And in 1942, the, the property was developed by the Spreckles interest into a housing tract in response to the critical need for housing in wartime San Diego. Meanwhile, in 1929, the normal school gained new stature by becoming the San Diego State Teachers College. With this ranking, the college could now grant certificates and degrees. Up until this time, the school had graduated 1,500 teachers, educated many San Diego children at its training school, and helped to expand the economic and cultural development of the city. During this time, the San Diego Junior College also became part of the normal school until 1947, when it became independent. In 1922, a smaller period revival building was, construction, was constructed on the Ed Center site for use as the San Diego Normal School drafting classroom and men's locker room. This two-story building has design features similar to those of the teacher's training annex and still stands today. As enrollment at the normal school grew, the student body began to outgrow the facilities which were built for a maximum of 600 students. In June 1928, the Bell Lloyd Investment Company offered 125 acres on Montezuma Mesa for new facilities for the San Diego State Teachers College. Before the new site could be built, San Diego voters had to approve buying of the old site, which it did overwhelmingly on May 15, 1928. The first classes were held at the Montezuma Mesa site in February 1931 and consisted of over 1,200 students. However, 
after the normal school moved to Montezuma Mesa, the buildings at the Ed Center site continued to be used for educational purposes, and the normal school was adaptively reused as Horace Mann Junior High. Other new buildings were constructed as well, which still stand today, including the Alice Burney Kindergarten Building, the Domestic Science and Band Room Building, the Girls' Shower Room, and the Teacher's Cafeteria. This is a photo of the Alice Burney Kindergarten Building, which was built in 1936 by the Works Progress Administration and still stands today. The end of World War II brought more population to San Diego and more changes to the Ed Center site. In, 1950s, in the 1950s, the Ed Center site was acquired by the State Board of Education in 1951, the new Alice Burney Elementary School was completed at its present location. Also in the same year, the Horace Mann Junior High School was relocated. And in 1953, San Diego City Schools built the new Eugene Brecker Education Center on the south lawns of the old normal, of the old normal school grounds, which still stands today. For a brief period in the early 1950s, the modern education center, indicated by the red arrow, sat adjacent to the historic complex of college buildings, indicated by the green arrow, creating a brief snapshot of San Diego's educational, social, and architectural history from the turn of the century to modern period. By 1955, however, the monumental normal school building had been demolished citing safety issues and a lack of compliance with building and fire codes, San Diego City Schools elected to raise the historic college building. A little more than 100 years after its founding, the University Heights community started coming together to preserve, protect, and adaptively reuse what was left of its significant history. While several significant landmarks had already been lost, including the magnificent Mission Cliff Gardens, the lovely pavilion at the Bluffs, the Grand Normal School, and the massive trolley barn, there was still much that remained. Beginning in 1991, the University Heights Community Association formed to save and adaptively reuse the eight and a half acre site of the former trolley barn which we know and love today as Trolley Barn Park. In 1997, the University Heights Historical Society obtained historic de designation of the remaining vestiges of Mission Cliff Gardens, including the former entrance to Mission Cliff Gardens on Adams Avenue at the end of North, including the Redwood Gate and some of the palm trees. Also, the cobblestone wall that stretches along Adams Avenue from Park Boulevard to its dead end just past Mission Cliff Drive. The cobblestone wall surrounding the former lily pond on Mission Cliff Drive at North Court, built by John Davidson and his workers. Also, the former entrance to the ostrich farm and park in Adams, including the Redwood Gate and the cobblestone piers. And lastly, the cobblestone remains of a drinking fountain which was once part of an ornate waiting station for the number 11 trolley. Also in 1999, the teacher's training annex was placed on the National Register of Historic Places through the efforts of the University Heights Historical Society. In 2013, the University Heights water storage and pumping station was also listed on the National Register of Historic Places thanks to the efforts of local historian Alex Bevel. And just this year, the beautiful historic homes along Panorama Drive became part of the Valle Vista Historic District. Also this year, the homes along Spalding Place became part of an historic district. 
These historic Craftsman bungalows were purchased in 1898 by the San Diego Electric Railway Association, along with the other assets from the failed Citizens Traction Company. So since the early 1990s, our community has come together again and again to protect, preserve, and adaptively reuse the landmarks from our very historic past. While several of our most historic, significant landmarks have been lost, we have a one-time opportunity today to preserve and adaptively reuse the historic buildings of the Ed Center site, perhaps our last and most important site. The Ed Center site is not only of local importance, but of regional importance to all of San Diego for its role in the educational, social, and economic development of San Diego. As you are probably aware, the San Diego Unified School District released an RFP in December 2017 for exchange of the Ed Center site along with other district properties for one larger property to become the new school district headquarters. This leaves the future of the Ed Center site uncertain and subject to possible development. We ask that you visit our website at edcenter.com to learn more about the history of the Ed Center site and what you can do to help save the historic buildings of this significant resource. Thank you very much for your time and attention today, and I hope that we continue to engage with the community to help save the historic Ed Center site.